welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are so glad to have you here for another amazing Ask and Answer episode of The Nonprofit Show. And as I just shared in the green room chatter, today is Fri-yay. And I yeah. always know when Tony's here that he will join me in the celebration of a Fri-yay. So we do have Tony Bell here. Cheers. Senior cheers. Yeah, cheers to that. <laughs> Senior Director, Relationship Center at National University. Uh, always so glad to have you, Tony, and always glad to have a representative from Fundraising Academy within National University. I, I love having conversations with the representatives over at Fundraising Academy. The team is amazing. The, the experience is like just stellar. So I really appreciate it. Uh, as we move forward, of course, we want to send out gratitude to our amazing presenting sponsors. So much gratitude. So I'll start out by giving a shout out to our besties over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy. Again, Fundraising Academy at National University. Thanks to Tony being here today. Nonprofit thought leader, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. Please do us a favor, yourself a favor, but our sponsors a favor. Mm -hmm. Check them out. They're amazing. And I also like to remind all of you, their mission is your mission. They're here to help you do more good. So please do check them out. And hey, we've produced almost 800 episodes. We, I, I feel like we have already. We might have already. Mm -hmm. um, but you can find all of our episodes on a streaming for a broadcast platform, podcast for audio platform, and the latest and greatest. And Tony, I kind of want to put you on the spot, my friend, but have you downloaded the app yet for the nonprofit show? I haven't, and I will. Yeah, I know. It's so good. So just a few hours after today's episode, once you download uh, the podcast, it, or sorry, the app, it will tell you that notification of, hey, the latest episode of the show has been uploaded. So make sure you check that out. Um, I love getting those notifications. So. Of course you do. <laughs> Well, hey, Tony, before we jump into you uh, and the conversation for today, which of mm -hmm. course is the ask and answer questions, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the conference that's coming up, Cultivate 2023 in uh, June. Will you tell us about this? Yeah, no, really excited to. And, and first, I have to give a shout out and, and you know kudos to the Fundraising Academy team at National University for all of the hard work that they put in to making this a really exceptional experience, uh, not only for emerging leaders, but for board members, for executive level uh, individuals, for anyone that's passionate around the nonprofit sector, and even more specifically around relationship-driven fundraising, uh, Cultivate is, is definitely the place to go. Uh, so when uh, when I was promoting uh, Cultivate the other day on LinkedIn, you know, I, I said before you can plant it, water it, nurture it and watch it grow, you have to cultivate the ground in which you want to harvest. And so that's really what Cultivate focuses on is, is really the foundation of, of building great relationships and being successful in your role as a uh, as a professional fundraiser so we'll have it's a one-day conference a lot of exceptional speakers and educational tracks a lot of good convening it's in person so we're super excited to bring a fully in-person experience uh for folks and we have a dynamic keynote speaker in ken miller yeah. so um uh, you know so folks can use the qr code here and get connected to the website and see all of the tracks it's an affordable $99. So it's a, you know, it's affordable for a really exceptional full day of learning and, uh, and community. I am so looking forward to it. I will be there. I'm also I can't wait to see you. I will the be nonprofit there show there. So we'll be broadcasting live for so Love for it. those of you watching, uh, do scan the QR code on this. It'll take you straight to the registration page. So much good happening. And who doesn't want to be in San Diego in June? So so join us. Come join us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Please join us. <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. And again, for, for all of your service into the sector. And we're going to jump right in. It looks like Chicago is uh, our first question from Joan today. You know how this works, but I'm going to ask the question um, or, or read the comment. We'll just, you know, dive into sure. sharing our expertise. So again, from Joan is uh, this statement and then question. I have a board who feels free to call me on the weekends and times where I am off of work. 
while I'm trying, while I'm always present for my nonprofit, I'm also trying to find more balance and time to recover. Ooh, I can feel that. Mm -hmm. How do I communicate this with the board without sounding like a slacker? Well, one thing I would recommend for Joan from Chicago, Jared, is to follow you on LinkedIn because you do such an exceptional job of really showing folks how to do this mm-hmm. and really showing individuals the importance and the value of, of balance. Uh, but the first thing that I that I thought about when, when I read that is the culture of the organization uh, and, and really looking at how do we lift the culture of the organization so that not just the senior level or executive director feels like they have work-life balance, but that we're providing that and making sure that we're that we're providing and creating that culture for everyone within the organization. So, so I think about that, and that's that's not a quick fix, right? That's that's a lot of really intentional, tough conversations uh, in order to make that kind of of culture shift. But I think that you know, aside from following you on LinkedIn, there's you know, there's plenty of of data, and and I say that just because I know and I've seen it. Can I reference one in particular right now? Yes, I can't, yes, yes. but you probably can. Uh, yeah. But there's plenty of data that would support why it's really important, especially for someone at that executive director level or senior leadership level, to find that balance and to understand the best ways and the most successful ways to define and communicate boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, I really appreciate the cultural component that you brought to this, Tony. One of the things I've noticed, and you know, one of the service lines I offer is that interim succession placement. So interim CEO, interim, you know, CDO. But One thing I have noticed is a lot of the board members tend to send emails nights, early mornings, and weekends. And my belief, right, around that or the story that I've created is they're often working their own standard hours. And then their volunteer opportunities and availability tend to open up on the nights, the early weekends and our early mornings and then the weekends. So, So you're right. Like, how do we display and create a good cultural balance for this, but it's also demonstrating, as you said, right, to the rest of the team, the rest of the staff. And the other thing I know to be true, so many uh, nonprofit leaders are really burnt out and compassion fatigue because we've all been on go mode, right, for Mm -hmm. the last three, four years in crisis and Mm -hmm. really, you know, working through that. So I think more than ever, it's a great opportunity to really establish some maybe communication expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've started to see that also, Tony, on on email signature blocks, right? Like I'll, I'll see something that says, here's my working hours, Or if you get a message from me outside of your working hours, please, you know, please return this at your convenience. Sure. Yeah. And giving the recipient that, you know, that grace, right. And and deeper understanding. The other thing that I would, I would say to Joan, because there was that comment about concern around being perceived as a slacker. Slacker. And and what I would say to, to Joan is that, you know, you are already I'm going to assume you are already highly respected and regarded. And that's why you're serving in this role. And really think about all that you bring to the organization Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of prevent yourself from from being your own worst enemy (laughs) in in this particular conversation. So don't think of yourself as a slacker just because you you have recognized the need to create boundaries and you've recognized the need for balance. That's not the definition of a slacker. Yeah, I I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for adding so much great insight there. So Joan, we hope we have helped you. Uh, I would would always love to hear back. So, okay, let's move over to St. Louis. So Alan writes in, this may seem like an odd question, but when does a a nonprofit adjust their mission statement? Is this a legal issue or more of a marketing issue? 
we have a new board member who is in advertising and public relations who came up with a snappier phrasing of our work. Oh, I love this question, Tony. Take it away. Well, everybody loves something that's snappy, right? So I don't blame them. It's like, oh, it's snappy. (laughs) Let's take a look at it. Uh, So when I was doing consulting work, I kind of would recommend, not kind of, I recommended uh, that organizations always, you know, look at their mission statement every three to five years. Again, just to just to remind themselves of how how does it truly connect to the work that they're doing? Is it still really representative of again of, of the programs and services that they're they're providing to the community? And we've seen a lot of organizations as we talk about coming out of the pandemic and this kind of new landscape. Many organizations made tremendous shifts. Um, you know, around the services that they were providing, they expanded the services that they were providing, reduced it, I mean, whatever that might have been. Uh, And so for a lot of them, it it is important that they revisit the mission so that the mission is, again, totally representative of the work and the contributions uh, that they're making to the communities that they serve. And, And so it's a little bit PR. I mean, that's, that's, Let's be real about that. I mean, you you want a mission statement that's going to instill something in someone, that's going to create a vision, uh, that's going to encourage them to take action. Uh, you know, a lot of times. So uh, so yeah, revisit it every three to five years. Uh, I'm not you know a CPA, an accountant, or an attorney, uh, but I I know in in my experience that. When I've worked with organizations and we did modify the mission statement, we made that modification in the annual uh, filing of their corporate documents. So uh, whatever state you're registered in, typically every year you have to you know, file your annual report uh, and you would make the modification. You can, you can make the modification of your mission statement during that process. Great information. Absolutely. Uh, I love that. I love the recommendation every three to five years. The other thing I've seen, Tony, is language lexicon changes, right? So what was appropriate to say in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s might not be appropriate to use even down to the base word, right? And so Sometimes you need to change the wording in your mission and still maybe you're you're still getting to the same essence of that mission, but using a different, uh, you know, word choice. So all of that is fantastic. Uh, you know, snappier is good, but we want to make sure that we convey, you know, really that essence of the mission. So, Alan, I hope you embrace this. Uh, wish you the best of luck. Lean into this board member who's advertising PR, see what he, she, or they can, can provide, you know, and support, support you in this. So, hey, good luck. Don't forget to file it, right? Right, exactly. (laughs) File the change. Okay. Well, you know, our friend Julia loves name withheld. She Um, loves the name withheld. Yes, she does. So I I know she's smiling on us right now from San Antonio. (laughs) This question is, Do you have any thoughts on advancing staff salaries? We have a valuable member of our team who is having a rough time and could use some help. While I want to have compassion, I am concerned that this is a problem for future issues that could arise. Now, this is interesting, Tony. What what is your thoughts on this question? Yeah, so uh, so when when I see this question, two different things came come to mind, right? It's when we think about advancing staff salaries, initially it was the conversation around pay equity and, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and and what are we doing to ensure that uh, within the workplace? The other, the other interpretation was we've got this team member that is in this scenario right now. And so we are considering advancing their salary uh, paying them maybe outside of what would be the normal pay schedule uh, in order to help them uh, overcome this particular you know moment in time. And and I, I love that someone would even entertain that. <laughs> uh, you know, a leader that that has that level of compassion or empathy, uh, first I would I would want to celebrate that they would even entertain that. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, you know, when, when we talk about equity and and inclusion, uh, that if, if you're going to offer this, then it needs to be something that is an employee benefit for everyone. Uh, so you would really need to consider how 
you could support this employee, uh, but then you would need to memorialize this benefit uh, and it would need to be something that you would be willing to offer everyone. So if you're going down that road, uh, there probably is an HR specialist that you should connect with. Uh, there may, you know, HR benefits specialist, maybe even your your legal advisor, uh, you know, around some of this. Uh, but then consider a cap. You wouldn't want to leave it open ended. Uh, so you might want to say that you would be willing to uh, advance a percentage of the salary, or you might say we will advance two thousand dollars, and that's kind of our benchmark for that. Uh, or our cap for that. So a lot to consider there, uh, but I think the, the first thing to really consider is, can we do this for everyone? Yeah, I, I'm with you on that and to memorialize a, a new process, a new system. The other thing as you were sharing this, Tony, that came to my mind is let's also look at the reimbursements. Mm. Is this employee and overall employees, are they asked to use their own money when it comes to certain items that maybe they're purchasing that are work related, be it lunch, be it office supplies, be it mileage and, you know, and gas and, and how quickly are we providing reimbursement? So to me, I really see this as an overall financial assessment, right? And then I wholeheartedly believe in the equitable. So if we're doing this for one person, we should and, and need to consider it for all of our staff. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard from our good friends at your part-time controller, right? Like <laughs> you, can, you can also look at weekly pay. You can look at daily pay, like there's new options that are are available. That's well beyond, you know, my skill set. I don't mind too, but I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, I don't pretend to play a CPA, not even on the nonprofit show. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think there's some opportunities. And then the one I did want to mention was the was the other interpretation of advancing staff salaries across the board, right? In a competitive workplace workforce how are we compensating our staff to retain our staff and it might be time you know um if you're having experience with this one employee struggling financially you know there could be an opportunity to say hey are we paying an equitable pay amount at this time has it shifted has it you know is this something that we need to consider but then again you can also look at maybe shifting your payroll from you know uh, bi-weekly to weekly to maybe even daily. So there's some options there, but. And those were great options to bring up, Jared. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I say reach out to our friends over at YPTC. <laughs> they might have a little bit more. They might have a little bit more insight, but we do For wish sure. you well. Yeah, we do wish you well. Ooh, oh, double, Ju double Julia, would, Julia would go crazy over this one. We've doubled down. Name withheld, city withheld. Okay. Our board, well, obviously this is why it's name and city withheld. Our board is trying to get the chair to resign. He is not engaged and he's not showing up for our board meetings. We have dealt with this before and I could use some advice so that we take the emotion out and move towards moving the board whole and productive. We also don't want to panic our other board members or our larger funders. So what advice would you share, uh, Tony, to this name withheld, city withheld, board withheld, agency and mission withheld uh, organization that has a board chair that is really not serving to the fullest capacity? Yeah. So this this question alone gave me anxiety uh, <laughs> be, just because it's 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 challenging, especially for any board member. I say all the time that, you know, board members are reminding folks all the time, board members are volunteers, yes. but they're volunteers with the highest level of accountability to the organization, but they're still volunteers, right? So just, we, we need to be mindful, mindful of that. Uh, I think initially about a lot of housekeeping stuff when I think of this question. And so I think about things like, what is, how is the removal of a board member defined in your bylaws? I mean, your bylaws should be very clear about how we transition a board member off of the board for any number of reasons. And all of those reasons should be defined in your bylaws as well. 
Uh, the other thing that I think about in terms of housekeeping are job descriptions and documented roles and responsibilities uh, for your chair, for your co-chair, for your secretary, your treasurer, your board member at large. All of these roles should have a documented and memorialized job description so that in these scenarios where someone is underperforming, you have something to refer to. So you can have a really robust and an intentional conversation around the expectations as documented in this job description versus the performance of the individual. So it becomes very clear uh, where at whatever level uh, the board member is not meeting the requirements or expectations as defined in, in the job description. Yeah, well put. And, you know, we often refer back to those bylaws. And so that really is the holy grail, if you will. And if it's not outlining this, great opportunity to great amend opportunity. your bylaws, right? And the other thing is, you know, really, Tony, what I see is the board chair should really be the one to set the tone of engagement and model their leadership and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, model that leadership, you know, to the to the board and to their peers. And we really want to have that strong at the top. The other thing I want to add to this very quickly is, you know, um, assume the best intent from everyone. Absolutely. And, and so when they, you know, are are voted in as board chair, treasurers in any position, mm -hmm. right? Let's make the assumption that the best intent was in place and every day the best intent is in place. So it might be, you know, um, time to have a, a pretty good conversation with this board member. Are you OK? Have things changed in your life? Have priorities shifted? Right. Um, and maybe in this case, it comes from the vice chair or another mm -hmm. executive position of For the sure. board but maybe not the CEO or executive director. So I think just a really good heart to heart conversation would be a great place to start. Remind them of what is documented in the bylaws, you know, if it is um, and, and go back to that. So it is. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. And that's not, you know, I wouldn't pull out a copy of the bylaws in the first conversation, right? right. So the first conversation, right. Right here. You're, you know, we're we're leading with empathy, right? And we're yes. we're we're seeking understanding, and we're seeking resolution, like you're saying, right? You know, Absolutely. considering the best in in people and and the best intention. So I'm yes. glad you brought all that up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So it's sticky, but we wish you the best. Okay, Joseph in Milwaukee, I like this one here. Um, I've been looking for some board service and I'm not sure how to go about it. I have my eye on a cultural group on our community in our community, but could use some strategy in getting involved. While I have not served on a board before, I have a lot of skills and passion for work. Share us, uh, share with us about this, Tony. What what have you given for advice? Yeah, so. So typically, I mean, it depends on kind of the state of the organization. Some organizations, they're like, we need board members and we need them bad. Yeah. So, you know, so they're willing, you know, to have those conversations and, and onboard folks based on their resume and their skill sets and, and where the board has a gap in talent and, and resources. Uh, aside from that, uh, I always recommend that you volunteer for an organization First, a lot of organizations will have some type of succession plan in place for their board. And typically that succession planning starts at volunteerism. So they'll look at individuals that are high performing volunteers that have demonstrated their level of commitment to the organization, uh, you know, demonstrated the, the skills and, and the added value that they can bring. Uh, and so, you know, you recognize those individuals and then you start kind of bringing them through whatever that leadership track looks like to get them that seat on the board. Yeah, great information. I love that. I've, I've led several board retreats lately, Tony, and that has certainly come up, you know, is how do we get new board members? How do we get more engaged board members? How do we build our board so that we have more of them, right? And it, right. it does tend to come up to say, hey, 
let's really engage with the volunteers, let's build our committees and let's see, you know, who really shines and and also demonstrates additional interest and in join the board. Um, the other thing I will share, Joseph, with you is, you know, I have reached out to organizations before to the executive director or the CEO, as well as the board chair, if I can find that information, let them know of my interest. You know, I have a really big interest in your mission. I would love to be of service. Curious if you have any board positions open, committee positions, volunteer opportunities. So I think also, Joseph, like being intentional with your outreach. I love mm -hmm. LinkedIn, um, but also you can find a lot on the website. I would recommend attending the events, introducing yourself, right? Like really making it known who you are and your interests that you bring. So commendable. We need board members, right? Absolutely. I, I wrote a, a post a long time ago. I cannot remember the date or the stats, Tony, but it was that there's 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the U.S. And the reality is every nonprofit is governed by a board. True. And let's say on average, there's seven board members, which you and I know that there's there's often very many more than that, <laughs> <laughs> right? So let's do the math, right? Seven times 1.8 million. I don't know the math of that right now, but that we, Joseph, what I'm saying is we need you, right? We yes. is a place for you. And perhaps this organization isn't looking at the moment. It could be six months, a year, two years down the road, but there's still an opportunity for you to, to become engaged in, a, in your community. So for sure. Kudos, kudos, kudos. Kudos. Yeah. So, all right, my friend. Well, that wraps up our ask and answered. I know we had, I think four, maybe five questions. It goes today. by so fast. It goes by quickly, but you know what also is going to come quickly and uh, go quickly is Cultivate. So Cultivate 2023, Thursday, June the 1st in San Diego. Tony will be there. I will be there. All of the Fundraising Academy representatives will be there. I think we're even getting Muhi back from his international travel for this. I think you are absolutely correct. <laughs> so right. there, will be, there will be a Muhi sighting at the uh, <laughs> at I, I know. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that and, and so many others. So again, please scan the QR if you are uh, looking at this screen. We encourage you to do that. Also a little hint, if you find my page on LinkedIn, I am a speaker and I shared my friends in a speaker code so you can get an even bigger discount, but it is extremely affordable. So hopefully, and I'm going to advocate that your organizations pay for this of course, uh, through that personal development. So check that out. We would so love to see you there. Thank and you. Tony, it is always lovely to see you. Ah, it's, it's always just, it's always such a highlight. I look forward to this so much. So thank you so much again for the opportunity to join you and, and, and share what's on my mind as it relates to these awesome questions that, that come in from viewers. Well, you bring so much insight. So thank you. And for those of you watching and listening, uh, a reminder, Tony Bell here today, he serves as the Senior Director, Relationship Center at National University. So thrilled to have you and your years of sage advice. Uh, just so, so very grateful. So uh, again, also grateful uh, to Fundraising Academy, National University being one of our presenting sponsors. So a shout out of gratitude to also to Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the companies day in, day out that join us and join you day in and day out to help you do more good in, around, and throughout your community. So Tony, always a pleasure. Happy Friday. Happy I hope, Friday. I hope it's a good one. For all of you that joined us today, again, thank you. Enjoy your weekend. For those of you that are celebrating Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day. Um, and we hope we'll see you back on Monday. As we end every episode, we want to remind you, all of you, ourselves included, to please stay well so you can do well. Thanks, Tony.